It's the year 1500. Pedro Alvarez Cabral is dispatched with the Second India Fleet to establish a permanent Portuguese trading post in India. Crossing the Atlantic, he follows a wide berth to better exploit the oceanic currents. Thus, on the 22nd of April, he sights what will become Brazil. This part of the new continent had already been known to Portugal, however Cabral's landing is the first instance when Portugal actually takes ownership of it. The fleet spends eight days off the coast of Brazil, and Cabral leaves behind a few convicts before he departs for India. A subsequent expedition is sent in 1501 to better explore the new continent. When the ships arrive, they pick up one of the convicts who provides them with valuable intelligence. Brazil at this time is inhabited by Tupi Indians, who live in small villages and use primitive Stone Age technology. Unlike the areas explored by Spain, there is no sign of gold or silver, or any advanced form of civilization. For now, the only valuable commodity to be found is Brazil wood, used for producing a reddish-purple dye. The following year, trade monopolies are granted to harvest Brazil wood. Soon a number of small, temporary trading posts spring up, mainly in the western portion of Brazil, the part that is easiest to reach from Portugal. But for now, Brazil remains a backwater. There is much more lucrative trade to be had in India and the Spice Islands in the Far East. Also, the Treaty of Tordesillas had been signed in 1494, partitioning the Americas between Portugal and its main rival, Spain. France, however, was not consulted at Tordesillas. In the following decades, Francis I sends his own expeditions and soon enough the French are setting up their own trading posts. By the 1520s, they are such a nuisance that it becomes clear to the Portuguese that they either settle these lands or lose them. To this end, 15 hereditary captaincies are created in 1530. These captaincies are granted to members of the Portuguese nobility who will be responsible for settling and developing them. Settlers, however, are not forthcoming, and neither is capital easy to find. Out of the 15 captaincies, only two, Pernambuco and São Vicente, are successful. The others either go bankrupt or get abandoned. Therefore, the king of Portugal decides that state intervention is needed. In 1548, Tomé de Sousa, the first governor of Brazil, arrives with settlers, money and soldiers. He establishes the city of Salvador in Bahia to serve as the new province's capital. In 1558, Memdesa takes over as governor. He is faced with a second incursion of the French. In 1555, the French establish a strong base in the captaincy of São Vicente. The Portuguese assemble 2,000 men and a large armada to attack them. By 1567, they force the French to leave and establish Rio de Janeiro in place of the French settlement. Memdesa spends the rest of his governorship putting finances in order, pacifying the Indians and building more settlements. By the end of the century, there are 30,000 Portuguese settlers in Brazil, and a number of cities have sprung up. Sugar has become the main cash crop of Brazil, most of the population and the production being concentrated in Bahia and Pernambuco. Slaves are being imported from Portuguese factories on the Gold Coast of Africa and Angola. In 1612, the French again tried to create settlements, this time in the north of Brazil, however the Portuguese easily expelled them three years later. At this time, the Portuguese Empire is at the zenith of its power, stretching from Brazil to both coasts of Africa, to India, to Malacca, to the Spice Islands, to Macau in China, and to Nagasaki in Japan. However, the jealousy that this creates among Europeans and a number of unfortunate circumstances already spell its doom. In 1578, after having invaded Morocco, Portugal's young monarch dies at the Battle of Alcazar. Sebastian had been the grandson of Charles V, therefore Philip II of Spain, his uncle, claims the Portuguese throne. <clears throat> in 1580, the two kingdoms, together with all their colonies, are united in what became known as the Iberian Union. Ideally, this should have been great news for Portugal, as the Union meant access to Spain's political and military power, as well as to markets dominated by Spain. However, as it happened, Portugal mostly got to share the innumerable problems plaguing Spain. In 1568, the revolt of the 17 provinces had broken out in the Low Countries. This means the Dutch who have been distributing most of the colonial goods of Portugal and Spain, and thus reaping at least half of the profits of colonization, no longer have access to their most lucrative trade. 
The Dutch being excellent seafarers decide to strike Spain and by default Portugal, where it would hurt them the most, at their colonies. To this end, the Dutch first spy on the Portuguese, then use the gathered information to send a group of explorers themselves. Cornelis Houtman's expedition arrives in Java in 1596. In 1602, the Dutch East India Company, or VOC, is founded. This is the first publicly traded company, and the world's first stock exchange in Amsterdam. This means it has access to immense amounts of instant capital, even matching the capabilities of great countries such as Spain. Furthermore, the company is granted full rights to act as a de facto state and take as much of Spain's and Portugal's colonies as they can. The Dutch immediately send their fleets to the Indian Ocean and start to attack the Iberian powers. In 1604, they blockade Goa with a large fleet. In 1606, they launch a failed attack against Malacca. In 1609, a 12-year truce is brokered between the Dutch Republic and Spain, however, the attacks don't stop. In 1610, the Dutch launch a series of attacks on the Spanish in the Philippines. In 1613, they capture Ambon. In 1619, they destroy Jakarta and establish their new capital, Batavia, in its stead. In 1622, Dutch and English fleets help the Persians capture Hormuz. In the same year, a Dutch fleet attacks Macau. Meanwhile, in 1618, the Thirty Years' War breaks out in Europe and the Twelve-Year Truce expires. By this time, the Dutch possess the strongest navy in the world. They still haven't achieved much in terms of conquest. However, they did conclude that when it came to overseas colonies, Portugal, the junior partner of the Iberian Union, was an easier target than Spain. Therefore, in 1621, the Dutch West India Company, or WIC, is founded. Their stated goal is to capture as much Portuguese territory in South America and West Africa as they can, thus becoming the dominant naval power in the Atlantic. The Dutch begin their assault in 1624, capturing Salvador in Bahia. In 1625, a joint Spanish and Portuguese fleet manages to recapture Salvador, however the Dutch attacks continue unrelenting. In 1630, they capture Recife in Pernambuco and make it the capital of Dutch Brazil. Soon they capture all of Pernambuco and from there they expand north and south. By 1641, the Dutch rule all from Maranhão to Sergipe. Since slaves are needed to work the sugar mills of Brazil, the Dutch also expand into Africa. In 1637, they capture Elmina from the Portuguese, followed by Luanda in 1640. In the same year, the Portuguese declared their independence from the Spanish crown. The Iberian Union is over, meaning peace could resume with the English. However, the Dutch continued their attacks, and now, in addition to this, Portugal has to contend with Spain, meaning that very few resources could be spared to safeguard its colonies. Portuguese Brazil is left to fend for itself and fight the Dutch with whatever they have at hand. Amazingly, they managed to do this with flying colors. In 1645, an insurrection breaks out in Pernambuco. Using guerrilla tactics, the Portuguese Brazilians manage to defeat the Dutch, first at the Battle of Tabocas, then at the Second Battle of Guararapes. Natives, Portuguese, and even the descendants of black slaves put up a united front against the Dutch and manage to expel them from their last bastion in Recife in 1654. Additionally, in 1648, a daring cross-Atlantic raid is launched from Rio de Janeiro, managing to recapture Luanda for the Portuguese. In the east, the Portuguese fare much worse against the more established Dutch East India Company. In 1638, the Portuguese are expelled from Japan. In 1641, Malacca falls to the Dutch. Colombo is captured by the Dutch in 1656, followed by Calicut in 1657 and Cochin in 1663. In addition to these losses, Muscat and Mombasa fall to a resurgent Omani Sultanate in 1650 and 1698. By the end of the century, Portugal is only left with Goa and Diu in India, East Timor and Macau in China. After this string of devastating losses, the Portuguese decide that the only way to hang on to their remaining possessions is if they can find a suitable ally who will be a worthy rival to the Dutch. The Anglo-Dutch Wars, starting in 1652, came just at the right time. 
Portugal strengthens its alliance with England by a royal marriage, giving Bombay as a dowry. Henceforth, Portuguese possessions in the east would remain unmolested from other European powers. However, this part of the empire will become a footnote of history in the following centuries. With all these problems in the east, Brazil's position becomes elevated within the empire. In 1693, gold is discovered at Minas Gerais. This triggers a gold rush and massive immigration not only from Portugal but from all across Europe. A discovery of diamonds in 1720 further increases immigration. By the end of the century, Brazil's population rivals that of Portugal. New industries such as tobacco, cattle, cotton and coffee increasingly take hold. Minor conflicts occur with Spain over the colony's borders. Due to the geography of South America, it was much easier for the Portuguese to explore the inside of the continent than it was for the Spanish who had to cross the Andes to do so. Therefore, by the 18th century, the land claimed by Portugal extends well beyond the Tordesillas line. By the beginning of the 19th century, Brazil is a prosperous but discontented land. Many would like to seek independence from Portugal. Portugal still follows a mercantilist economic model, forbidding their colonies to directly trade with foreigners. Brazilians are not happy about this. In 1807, Napoleon invades Portugal, prompting the royal family to flee to Brazil. The king is forced to adopt free trade, and in 1815 elevates Brazil to equal status with Portugal. After the war is over, the royal family goes back to Portugal. The king's son, Prince Pedro, is left behind to manage the colony. Instead of following his father's instructions, Pedro sides with those wanting independence. In 1822, the Empire of Brazil is declared, and Pedro becomes its first emperor. Portugal is in no position to attempt to recover Brazil. Instead, they focus most of their attention on Africa. In the 19th century, Angola and Mozambique are developed into countryside territories. However, since the British also have territorial desires in the region, the Portuguese are unable to connect the two colonies across Africa. In the First World War, Portugal fights against the Germans in Germany's African colonies. Decolonization comes hard for Portugal. Antonio Salazar, Portugal's head of state, refuses to give up any colonies. Free from British rule, India annexes Goa and Diu in 1961. The same year, fighting breaks out in Angola and Mozambique that ultimately leads to Salazar's fall from power. In 1974, both Angola and Mozambique are granted their independence. One year later, East Timor also becomes independent and Macau is handed back to China in 1999. Thus rose and fell the Portuguese Empire.